Galia es omnis divisa in partes tres. All Gaul is divided into three parts. So begins the opening lines of the famous Commentari de Bello Gallico, a series of yearly dispatches written by Gaius Julius Caesar detailing his actions during his wars with the tribes of Gaul. From 58 to 50 BC, Caesar launched a campaign that would take him from the banks of the Rhine to the shores of Britannia, conquering huge swaths of territories in modern-day France, Belgium, and Switzerland, exterminating the Celtic peoples which Rome had dealt with for so long, and ultimately setting the stage for the civil wars yet to come. It is easy to interpret the Gauls and other Celtic peoples as a bunch of fur-clad savages, but the archaeological evidence, filling the gap in left by the lack of Celtic histories, suggests a society that was well-developed in metalworking and had extensive trade networks throughout Europe. Each Celtic society, generally occupying what could be called a, quote, opida, akin to a walled town, and under the leadership of aristocratic societies, Kings were uncommon in Gaul, and most aristocrats needed both material goods and martial skill to command his fellow tribesmen. They were not completely hegemonic in language and culture, as Caesar himself notes, separating to possibly three distinct groups, the Belgae to the north, the Aquitani to the west, and the Gauls to the northeast. The military ethos that the Gauls and Celts were based upon was largely on individual martial skill. Those who were particularly talented managed to get their hands on the best weapons and armor which would often look somewhat similar to what the Romans had. The famous legionary helmet was adapted from an Gallic original, actually. Their infantry tended to use longer slashing swords and focused on individual behavior rather than the strict cohesive discipline so famously demanded by the Roman commanders. However, they excelled in cavalry, and their horsemen became a frequently softer auxiliary troop formation to bolster the legions. The relationship between the Celtic peoples and those of the Mediterranean basin has been a complicated, if not tumultuous one. Likely to be trading partners as much as they were fearsome warriors, the Celts had managed to successfully invade many lands of southern Europe. The Book of Galatians from the New Testament of the Bible refers to the people of the same name, the Galatians, who actually were Celts who invaded and settled in Anatolia during the 270s. In 387 BC, the Gallic chief Brennus managed to successfully sack the city of Rome which remained the only time the Eternal City was under foreign occupation until the 5th century AD with the rise of the Goths. This event deeply traumatized the Roman peoples, giving them a vicious hatred towards the barbarians over the Alps. In 59 BC, Julius Caesar ended his year's term as consul, the highest elected position of authority in the Republic. By arranging his post as proconsul, a tactical extension of his consular power without actually being a consul, where he would serve as the governor of Transalpine Gaul, literally translated as, quote, our side of the Alps. Caesar's funds were dangerously low. He barely managed to afford his election with the help of the famed Crassus, and many men looked to have Caesar arrested for his bribery. On top of this, Caesar was getting up in age, and sought imperium, a term reflecting the power to command. Gaul was divided, just as Caesar stated in his commentaries. All he needed now was his bellum justum, his just cause. In 61, a client Gallic tribe of the Romans called the Adui appealed to the Senate asking for protection from a Germanic army led by a King Ariovistus, who was being called in by anti-Roman Celts to serve as mercenaries against the pro-Roman tribes. The Adui were a part of the complex patron-client system which was so integral to the Roman society, and they also served as a buffer state between the hostile tribes and the Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, literally Gaul on the other side of the Alps. In 59, there were also the migrations of allegedly 350,000 people, called the Helvetii, who were placing pressure on the Adui and affecting the stability of the region. Caesar, who additionally inherited Transalpine Gaul via the death of its former governor, leapt at the opportunity to raise a consular army comprised of four legions, roughly 18 to 20,000 legionary troops, and a collection of Gallic cavalry auxiliaries. Caesar's legions got their first taste of battle in the spring of 58, squaring up against the army of the Helvetii, who were also aided by the tribes of the Boii and Tulingi, making a total Gallic force of 45,000. Caesar managed to set up his deployment on a hilltop, and, despite efforts by the tribes to outflank the legionaries, a smashing Roman victory was gained thanks largely to the tactical flexibility of the legionary formation. However, once the rout of the Helvetii began, a massacre immediately followed. When the legions chased the fleeing troops, the women and children of the tribe were found remaining back at their camp. Of the original 350,000 tribesmen who had entered Gaul, 
Caesar comments that only 110,000 were left to send back. After scattering the Helvetii, Caesar then turned his attention towards Ariovistus. The matter was complicated due to the fact that Ariovistus had been declared a friend and ally to the Roman people the previous year by the Senate, thus a reasonable cause was needed. Caesar claimed that the king was ordering acts of banditry throughout the countryside. Under this justification, he harassed the German encampment until a forced battle would occur. The response of the Germans didn't take long, and the retaliation of Ariovistus was swift. But thanks to the aid of his cavalry officer, Publius Crassus, Caesar managed to hold the line and come out victorious. He inflicted 80,000 German casualties on the opposing army. This last offensive let Caesar finish off the season with great success, and with a bolstered confidence, he retired to his winter quarters. Now that he eliminated two historical threats to Rome, he began to formulate his plans. No longer content with just pacifying the region as he originally set out to do, now the whetted appetite of his ambition demanded only one thing, the complete and utter domination of all of Gaul.